Uh, thanks for coming in. Uh, we're going to be hearing from hopefully three politicians talking about uh, various themes of courage in politics. And I think we've got three slightly different versions of courage in politics here, but they all deserve credit for, in their own ways, stepping up to the plate and putting forward their case in a sometimes hostile political environment. I'm gonna go in order of most experience to least. We have uh, Peter Phelps with quite a lot of political experience. Uh, Malcolm Roberts, who's come in for a couple of years, and then Aaron Stonehouse, who has just got elected and hasn't even taken his seat. So we've got... No, well, you got elected a while. Okay, nine months, sure. But you've been, okay, you've been in there, you've faced the wrath of uh, Fairfax and the ABC. Uh, so anyway, a lot of experience, some and none. Uh, so without further ado, please welcome the Honourable Dr. Peter Phelps. Uh, thanks very much, everyone. Uh, on the 22nd of March last year, I resigned as whip for the government in the upper house of the New South Wales Parliament. And I did so because uh, the legislation which they'd introduced for um, a mandate for ethanol was so repugnant that I simply couldn't support it. Um, the ethanol mandate in New South Wales requires a bit of history. Um, it was originally introduced by a former minister named Tony Kelly, uh, who later made a number of appearances at ICAC. Um, it was done on the basis that uh, there should be an ethanol mandate for all fuel sold in New South Wales uh, because of the environmental benefits which ethanol provides. Of course, that wasn't the real reason. The real reason was because Manildra made substantial donations to the Labor Party and that the key uh, uh, facility for the production of our ethanol in New South Wales was in um, a marginal seat called the seat of Kiama. So Tony Kelly, who was the then Labor Minister at the time, introduced the Ethanol Bill, which became the Ethanol Act, and it mandated that over a period of years, the amount of ethanol uh, sold in New South Wales as a proportion of all petrol products had to go from 2% to 4% and ultimately 6%. Um, that was right, that was fine when it went at 2% and then when it went to 4%, but when it got to 6%, it never reached that figure. In fact, it only barely touched 4%. Uh, at the time. But we came into government and we inherited uh, the, uh, the existing legislation. Uh, they got around it by uh, the Minister for Energy every month would sign off uh, on a, a form which said this, this mandate cannot be met under current circumstances. And all four of the major fuel companies uh, sought uh, permission every month uh, and received permission to not meet the mandate which had been set for them. Because when you hear a ma an ethanol mandate of 6%, you think, well, that, that, that's, pretty, that's pretty reasonable. That's, that's not much. But you have to remember that the wording of the Act is such that it's not 6% of total fuel sold is E10. No, no. 6% of all fuel sold has to be ethanol. So you have the product E10, but you have the chemical compound ethanol. Because ethanol is only found in... Uh, E10 at 10% rates, that means to hit a rate of 6% of total fuel volume, in fact, 60% of your total fuel sales has to be E10. And there's literally no service station anywhere in New South Wales which comes anywhere near that. There are some in Western Sydney which get around 45%, but the majority, in fact, the average across uh, Australia is only 22%. So 22% of your sales is E10. In other words, you make 2.2% and you're required to do 6%. Well, this was going along quite nicely. It was clearly an impossible situation which couldn't be rectified. And so the minister understood that and signed off on it. Then after the 2015 election, we had a new minister uh, come in. And in the uh, intervening period of eight months, uh, he met with Manildra on no fewer than six occasions. At the end of that period of time, on the week before Christmas, he put out a press release saying that uh, we are going to change the way we deal with the ethanol mandate in New South Wales. So now it won't be the major companies uh, which will be required to meet this mandate, but individual service stations. So the individual service stations now have a requirement, a legal requirement, that 60% of their fuel sales has to be E10. Well. The devil's always in the detail, so I had a few comments to say at the time uh, and then waited till after the Christmas break and we came back. And so we finally got the, uh, the draft legislation uh, come through, it went to, to the party room 
and I raised my significant concerns that I had with it at the time. Uh, not feeling, well, and the party room, of course, ignored me uh, because everyone assumes in politics these days that if a minister puts forward something, then it must be a good idea because ministers are such smart people and they have departments filled with really smart people and so therefore there can't be anything possibly wrong with this legislation. Uh, I raised my concerns in the party room. I wasn't sure that I was listened to because everyone else said, oh, yeah, let's, let's just do it anyway. Um, so I went and saw the Premier and I explained my concerns to him and specifically the, the concerns of what you're effectively doing is you're going to be criminalising the owners of service stations for the legal purchasing de decisions of their customers. In other words, you'll be forced to pay a fine if your customers don't buy enough of product X. Um, that was... Uh, taken on board and eventually he said, well, have a meeting with the minister. I had a meeting with the minister and the minister was totally unresponsive. And so eventually, uh, by the time that uh, it got round uh, to um, a further reconsideration of this, um, there was no change, uh, no change. So then I organised a delegation of uh, my colleagues from the upper house and every backbencher bar one went and saw the Premier we explained our situation and said we consider this to be a completely illiberal bill um, and we are opposed to it. And the Premier very kindly said, OK, we'll withdraw the bill in the short term, we'll get actual metrics on whether this can be achieved uh, and it won't uh, be returned to Parliament uh, until it's been through the party room again. Uh, the following day, he then announced that uh, that wasn't to be the case because the uh, meeting had leaked from someone in that room to the media and that he was proceeding to ram through the bill uh, into uh, the parliament. Well, it went through um, and I said that I couldn't support uh, the idea that the Liberal Party would be uh, effectively um, criminalising um, ordinary small business owners uh, on the basis that uh, their customers decided that they actually didn't want to put E10 in their vehicles. Um, and so I resigned at that point. Later on, the regulations came out and it proved, just to, be, uh, proved to be just as uh, disastrous as I thought it would be. And that is, you'll now have a situation where if you sell more than 900,000 litres a quarter, which sounds like a lot, everyone says, oh, 900,000 litres, that's a lot. You've got to remember on an average uh, return, well, an average uh, cost, price, well, uh, an average differential, you'd probably make about $30,000 from selling 900,000 litres of petrol um, on average. So that means basically, say, $120,000 a year before you pay for any other associated costs. So just on selling the petrol, you're making about $120,000, and that's at the bottom end of the scale. But if you don't sell enough, you'll be fined $55,000 for your first infringement, and then $550,000 every quarter for every subsequent infringement. Um, that I thought was quite remarkable. Um, and again, some of my colleagues have said, well, look, we know that there's something wrong with the system, but you know, I'm sure something will be worked out. Well, something will be worked out. When the first um, penalty notices start going out in August of this year, uh, what you'll find is that of the 2,000 or so service stations across Australia, 98% uh, will have failed to uh, meet the requirements and hence will be fined. And they'll be fined because people exercise their free choice not to buy E10. Uh, that's an illiberal piece of legislation. That's an illiberal regulation. And that's why I said, stuff you all. I'm resigning. Let me just turn the timer on. Thank you very much. Um, I want to express some appreciation to some people uh, for the, what they've done. First of all, Milton Friedman, and uh, for what he continues to do. And also the University of Chicago, where I graduated from with an MBA a few years ago now. and. Um, I'm very heartened to know that the Dean at the, at the University of Chicago this year, or last year, sorry, 2016, welcomed the new students by send, sending them all a letter saying, welcome to the University of Chicago where you will be subjected to many different ideas. 
there isn't a free space here, a safe space. Just suck it up and get into it. So, wonderful. I uh, also want to uh, express my appreciation to Andrew Cooper. I just saw him a minute ago. Where is he? There he is. Well done, Andrew. And Andrew does a lot of work in, in Queensland for keeping freedom alive. And also H.R. Nichols and Samuel Griffith Societies, because I've been members of, of those societies for a long time now. And the common thing that goes through all of those groups and all of the people that I've mentioned is they have a positive approach to life positive approach to humans. And that's what we see with people who love freedom. Isn't that true? So I really appreciate that. Now, uh, I was told to talk for five ten, uh, to uh, 10 minutes, so I'm going to keep the timer on. Where's Darren? Can you tell me this timer might go off after five minutes without signaling? So if you could just tell me, just get it going when it's, uh, yeah. First of all, let's get straight into courage. So I looked at the dictionary definition because to me, courage means integrity. That's all it is. So this is the dictionary's definition. The quality of mind or spirit that enables a person to face difficulty, danger, without fear, in other words, bravery. Well, to me, if someone has a very minor obstacle to overcome and shows the courage to address that, that's not necessarily courageous. I'll give you an example. People say they like my courage in addressing the greens. That's fun. There's no courage in that. I enjoy it. They're the biggest disruptive force, the most dangerous force in politics. So not only do I see them as anti-human, that's why I call them out, because they are anti-human. And it's my responsibility to call them out. There's no courage needed to tackle the green, none at all. Now, for some other people, it might be courage. Uh, when I went nine years without income because I was chasing the climate fraud, and which we're still chasing, then I think that was courage especially on my wife's part. So, uh, and it was, now then, um, we're, we're currently locked in a debate with the CSIRO. They didn't know they were in a debate, but they found themselves there now. And we will chase them down. So we're, we're going to respond, they're going to respond to our response to them pretty soon, in two weeks, in fact. But um, one of my staff said, let's give them some wriggle room. I said, no, we don't give them wriggle room. We just stick with the facts. That's what's got us into this position, and that's what we'll keep doing. And that's so easy then. You don't need courage if you've got facts. It's just easy. And that's one of the things we see in politics. There's very little facts. So um, when I was uh, going, just about to go to the University of Chicago Graduate School of Business, I found out that I was on the wait list for acceptance. So I called a friend and said, how do I get to be accepted? And he said, well... What you do is you make them a promise that if accepted, you will go. So I made a promise and I, I said to them that I would attend if they offered me a position. The next day, I got a scholarship offer from Columbia University, two, two years free tuition. I said, sorry, I can't take it. But that's easy then. So that's why I say, um, and I got into Chicago anyway, which was great. But that's why I say courage is really about integrity. And Peter Phelps showed us his integrity. And that's all courage is. So I want to talk more about, to give you an example of the scale, when I did an Outward Bound course, 26-day course many years ago, there was a, a man who was on a rock, rock wall. And most of us could clamber up the rock wall easily. And he froze halfway through the rock wall. And he couldn't go any further. And we just talked him through it and up he went. That takes courage. It doesn't take much courage to scramble up if you can do it easily, but that took courage. Another person who couldn't swim, we, we towed him on a lilo, and I actually did most of the paddling for him. And people came up to me and said, wow, it's amazing, you paddled for two of you. I said, yeah, but he can't even swim, and he's floating down the Murrumbidgee River. That's courage. So I just want to give you my understanding of courage, which is really strength of character. It's honesty about self and with self. And that's where Pauline Hanson really shines. She is an amazing person to just be with and to work with. Self-discipline, staying the course. I organized a leadership conference at the University of Chicago and one of the participants, one of the speakers was Bob Galvin who ran Motorola, chairman, CEO and president. And he said, what really makes leaders is when they make the minority decision. Everyone in the room is against what they want to do, but they still do it. Not through stubbornness, but because they know it's right. 
They've listened and they consult, but they still do it. So they stay the course despite setbacks. Another one that I think is, is, um, is, requires courage and illustrates courage is admitting errors. Women are pretty good at this, men tend not to be. And to also apologize. And so when Darren Hinch stood up in parliament and said that he'd made a mistake on the ABCC, I won't tell you some stories as to how he got to that point, but I admired his courage and said, said so in the floor of the Senate. When Peter Dutton <coughs> gave us as, as, a, as a party, Pauline Hanson's One Nation Party, a presentation on immigration, I congratulated him partway through it because it deserves congratulations. There are no, no political enemies when what we see is our job is to advance Australia, not to look after the party. A party in Pauline Hanson's party is a vehicle for her real job, our real job, which is to look after Australia. Honestly considering criticism and honestly seeing them as gifts, even when they come from the Greens, because when the Greens do it, it's still a way of sharpening our argument and also maintaining high standards. And another one that I think is really important is allowing people to do their job, giving them space, allowing them to talk and listening to them. And I honestly think that uh, going out into the bush and listening to people, listening to people in Brisbane, Sunshine Coast, Gold Coast, is just so invigorating because it, make, it grounds me and it brings me back to reality. So that's why I say that courage is simply about integrity. So how long have I been talking, Darren? <laughs> that means it's over five minutes. That means it's over five minutes, so uh, uh, I, that's where I'll stop for now, and um, I'll be happy to answer questions later. Thank you. Uh, hi. Um, I'm Aaron Stonehouse. I've uh, recently been elected to the upper house of the West Australian Parliament. Is this meant to be on? That's for the recording. No worries. Um, <clears throat> uh, in the recent March 11 election, uh, as a Liberal Democrat, Liberal, Liberal Democrat candidate, I'm the first uh, Libertarian Party member to be elected to the West Australian Parliament. <clears throat> uh, my term doesn't start until May 22nd, so I officially haven't started yet. Luckily, I haven't had my courage tested yet in the way Malcolm Roberts or Peter Phelps have. Um, <clears throat> so I thought I'd use this opportunity to just tell you a little bit about myself, how I got here, and uh, the current state of, uh, of West Australia. Uh, up until now, I've had no direct involvement in politics. I'm a pretty average 26-year-old libertarian. Uh, I've never worked as a union lawyer or a Liberal Party staffer. Uh, I was working as a call centre manager up until about two weeks ago. Um, so this is all fairly new to me. Uh, I was first li introduced to libertarianism through uh, the skeptic movement. Uh, I used to follow personalities like Penn and Teller. Um, <clears throat> after that, around about 2008, like probably most people my age, I discovered Ron Paul. Uh, and then through him, more libertarian thinkers and, and, uh, and classical liberal thinkers, people like Thomas Sowell, uh, Milton Friedman, uh, F.A. Hayek, uh, and the such. <clears throat> but at that time, um, I was under the impression that the libertarian moment was a purely American phenomenon. Uh, I didn't know there was any libertarians in Australia at that time. That was up until uh, 2013, with the election of Senator David Lanehelm. <clears throat> uh, this put the LDP on my radar. Um, there was finally a libertarian option in Australia. <clears throat> uh, shortly after that, I joined the LDP in uh, 2014. Uh, when the LDP registered for the West Australian election, the call went out for candidates. Uh, so I put my hand up. I saw it as an opportunity to throw my hat in the ring and finally get involved in a movement that so far I'd really only been a spectator in. I figured, what's the worst that could happen? Well, we got enough of the primary vote and, <laughs> and uh, with, the, with the preferential voting system in West Australia, I wound up elected. <clears throat> um, looking forward, that there is a lot of work to be done in WA. The, uh, the former Liberal government has left, a, left the state with a $40 billion debt and a deficit that's forecast at about $3 billion. <clears throat> Uh, WA has seen a, a huge downturn in its mining industry. We've lost, I think, over the last two years about 20,000 jobs from the mining industry. Uh, unemployment is at about 6%, a little bit above the national average. Um, <clears throat> uh, and even at this time, there are still people calling to raise the, uh, the rent on minerals, um, like that'll help. Um, 
The oil and gas industry is in a similar situation. The former Liberal government's solution to WA budge, WA's budget woes were to spend $100 million on a new open range zoo, uh, spend $190 million on the war on drugs, and to spend about another $2 billion on a road literally to nowhere. Um, so uh, we've got a little bit of work ahead of us. Uh, with the March election, the centre-left Labor government is now in power. Uh, however, they only have 14 seats in the upper house. Um, with, uh, with the president being a, most likely going to be a Labor member, they have 13 votes. Even with the support of the Greens and their four seats, they still don't have a majority in the upper house to pass bills. This is where the crossbench comes in. Assuming Liberal and Nationals oppose uh, the Labor government and the Greens, the Labor government will need one vote from the crossbench. The crossbench is currently comprised of myself and the Liberal Democrats. The Shooters and Fishers Party have one seat and One Nation has three seats. <coughs> Uh, now, <clears throat> I've made a similar pledge to what Senator David Landhelm has made in the past, that I'll never vote for an increase in taxes or a reduction in liberty. I'll always vote in line with my conscience and I'll do what I can to uphold libertarian values. But any issues that don't fall within the scope of taxes or liberty, I have an opportunity now to negotiate with the government and hopefully bring a little bit more freedom back to WA. <clears throat> there is, uh, there's one more cause for optimism. Uh, with the 13 votes the government has in the upper house and with potentially the five votes from the crossbench, the crossbench with Labor can uh, pass bills on their own without the support of the Greens. This makes the Greens effectively irrelevant in the upper house if the crossbench works with the Labor government. So hopefully we have an opportunity to remove the influence of some of the more regressive socialist aspects uh, of the Greens influencing Labor policy. Um, but like I said, I haven't started yet, so uh, my journey's just beginning. Um, I don't have too much to say, but I'd be happy to answer questions later on. Do we have any questions for any of the three courageous politicians among us? Well, that's very quick. I've got one question. Oh, doesn't... Um, it, it, the mining industry in Western Australia is booming. It's absolutely raging. It's the construction industry that has collapsed because construction of the new mining projects has completed to enable the mining industry to continue its traje trajectory upward. Is that a question? Just a statement. Okay. Um, are there no questions? Because we can just continue eating and drinking and head back to the next session. But... All right. All right. I all right, just uh, what? <laughs> one last minute, if you will, just if you all tolerate. One thing which I didn't add was the, the whole concept of, uh, of courage in politics. And people say, oh, you know, it's very courageous of you to do that. It's actually not that courageous. What you have to do is, if you have a philosophical touchstone, if you apply principles to the policies which come before you, it's actually not that hard. Those people who require courage are those people who have no principles, who have no touchstone, who have no philosophy, and who have to then make the decision of, oh, well, is this going to materially help me or benefit me in my local electorate? Is this going to help my career? For the pragmatist, the degree of courage required is far higher. For a person who has a, a philosophical touchstone, I sleep very soundly at night because I know that I haven't corrupted my conscience. I haven't violated uh, any uh, philosophical ideals that I hold. And for that, it's very easy to make those sorts of decisions. Um, just one final thing then uh, in thanking the speakers. Uh, for Malcolm, uh, I see the courage when he goes on ABC or talks to anyone from Fairfax. And when they push him, he just pushes back quite bluntly. And, and that's nice to see in politics these days. Uh, for Aaron, uh, he's basically taken a, at least a short term, maybe a long term hiatus from his life to jump in with both feet as a 26 year old man into the, the front of the liberty movement battle in this country. But I wanna particularly uh, mention, maybe this isn't an issue of courage, but it's an issue of self-sacrifice that deserves our respect and our thanks. And that is Peter Phelps giving up $40,000 a year on a point of principle, on a point of pro-liberty principle. So please thank them all, but I mean, thank you, Peter as well. Yeah.